Isaiah Helikunihi Walker ko ui no noho au ma ka ahupua o haula ka no hilo mai au ma ka ahupua o keo ka he havai i au. So my name is Isaiah Walker and uh, I am from um, the Big Island of Hawaii, a town called Keo Kaha, and um, I was born and raised there. Um, I am Hawaiian. I'm also Scottish and English and Portuguese. And in Hawaii, the Portuguese are known for talking a lot. So, ekalamai, excuse me, but uh, you know, giving a Portuguese a microphone is um, sometimes not a good idea. True. <laughs> so I want to say uh, a big mahalo to everyone who uh, put on this conference, and uh, it's been exciting uh, for me to see. Um, particularly because I went to school down the road in Santa Barbara, and while I was in graduate school about 10 years ago, um, it was kind of a challenge to convince my colleagues and peers and so forth that by writing a dissertation on the history of surfing that it was a legitimate subject to study. And I actually had to convince many people that. Fortunately, I had an advisor um, who believed in me. So those of you in school or in grad school, it's important to have supportive um, advisors. Um, on this topic of localism, um, I'll make three key points that are listed up here today, and you can read those. Um, first, the native Hawaiian experience is unique, different than all other forms of localism. Second, that Haole surfers have erroneously appropriated Hawaiian localism. And third, respect and reciprocity is a key Hawaiian concept that few people, I think, fully understand. <clears throat> so, on the first point, Hawaiian surf tensions. <clears throat> this topic of surf localism, um, a lot of it has its roots in this concept of tradition. But Hawaiian surf tensions are different from other, other brands of localism because others, say, in California or in Australia, are not affixed to the historical complexities of social, cultural, and political conquest. Um, so in other words, Hawaiian surfers have issues that plunge deep into their uh, core processes of identity formation, culture, and their conflict. As progenitors of the sport, Hawaiian surfers are self-proscribed -pro cultural practitioners. This is a cool shot of this is being Pohaku many years ago. And uh, I run a surf club for kids. And um, increasingly, we're seeing in Hawaii um, access for our, our keiki to the ocean is, is being uh, more and more challenging. Um, a lot of it has to do with, with um, you know, it's expensive to, to surf. It's a privilege. We're, we're elites, in fact, to have those kinds of privileges. And, Unfortunately for many kids, um, they don't have that access, but I appreciate um, Pohaku, and um, he's come and visited our, our keiki and our community, and is brought within these, these papahe nalu, these surfboards. Um, something that's always fascinated me was, I was always shocked when he would come and he'd bring these boards, you know, that most of us would see as expensive. I've heard a lot of this conference, the word money thrown around. Um, but these boards, although they're, they're worth a lot of money, uh, he doesn't see them in that light. I appreciate that. Um, this is a picture of my son uh, riding one of the boards. And um, it's one thing I really value and appreciate, whereas most people would hang these things up on a wall. He's the first one to say, nah, go, go, ride them, boy. Even let my son hold this board for over a year. A rare uh, willy willy wood, which our forests in Hawaii are are being uh, you know, threatened because of um, some disease and stuff. But, and my son dinged the board once. I was like, oh my gosh. And he's like, nah, small kind. It just gives it character. 
Um, and most of us, I don't, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a very native concept, I think, of just this sense of um, not thinking about the economic value, uh, but of its spiritual value. So for that, I appreciate it. So what empowers and fuels the Hawaiian psyche more is that surfing was a cultural art that survived two centuries of colonial conquest and degradation. And this didn't happen by chance. Hawaiian surfers actively fought to preserve their space in the Hawaiian surf. While politics and social tensions on land often marginalized Hawaiians, the surf zone became the front lines of cultural preservation for many Hawaiians. In many ways, Hawaiian surfers are not really surf locals at all, at least as the surfing world determines and defines that term. Rather, they are natives struggling to maintain a social space that is increasingly being taken from them. Hawaiian frustrations in the surf are inextricably linked to the baggage of colonization. In the um, this book, Waves of Resistance, I uh, explain how this carries out in various um, times throughout Hawaiian history, uh, from the Waikiki clubs, the Hui Nalu, um, to uh, Save Our Surf, which was a group um, started by um, a Haole guy named um, John Kelly. Um, I, want, I guess I should pause here, a little footnote. The term haole is not necessarily a racially derogatory term. I think we need to understand that because oftentimes people will, oh, he called me a haole. Um, I call myself a haole a lot too. I'm Hawaiian, I'm haole. Uh, local, local people will refer to themselves in that way. But it's oftentimes um, the term haole is also a term that has to do with one's behavior. That's not necessarily a racial category. Um, so when I, ref when I use the word haole today, um, it, um, it does apply to, to behavior as well. Um, so I also, in the book, talk about how these notions of, um, of, of colonial resistance tie into to local people in the 1970s, um, particularly a group called the Hui or He'enalu. Uh, again, the term Hui means club. All right, so just because somebody says hui doesn't mean the one group that you're thinking of. Um, there are several. Also in the 1960s, <clears throat> um, there's this great movement in the 1970s that was inspired in many ways by other global native movements, um, including the civil rights movement in America, uh, Native American movements in America, uh, the Maori movements in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, and a variety of other um, peoples during this era of decolonization. And so Hawaii was definitely influenced by that. And you saw in the film how Eddie had this yearning for attaching to his Hawaiian culture. Um, a lot of that is born from this kind of uh, movement that's going on in Hawaii. So in many ways, in, in the story it talks about Rabbit, um, timing was an issue too. A lot of Hawaiian uh, sentiment was pretty raw 1976. Um, right. So unfortunately, locals from California, Australia, and elsewhere have erroneously appropriated and adopted behavior from some Hawaiian activists in the surf, while Haole enforcers have drawn inspiration from some Hawaiian warriors, their claim to being a surfing local is quite shallow in comparison. Neither grounded in centuries of history, culture, or conquest as seen with the native Hawaiian. Thus, that brand of localism seems more simplistic and less justified or grounded in history. Um, I was going to leave that up to our Santa Cruz panel to discuss, and our, our um, but something to, to definitely consider. Now, often the term respect is used to justify territorialism in the surf. It becomes a generic kind of uh, word, right? Oh, he never respect me or something like that. But <clears throat> I believe the word is often misused and understood. However, I want to focus on the Hawaiian concept of reciprocity to provide more clarity on what respect means in Hawaiian surfing lineups, and I think in any surfing lineup. In Hawaiian culture and most Pacific Island cultures, for that matter, reciprocity is central 
to human relationships, protocol, and is a sign of respect. Essentially, it means to recognize the presence, importance, and value of other people. Reciprocity is often expressed in traditional exchanges of ten tangible items like food, kappa, and other gifts. Reciprocity means to give of oneself or possessions to another, and the person receiving that aloha is expected to reciprocate by giving back. Aloha is a two-way exchange that ties people to one another in healthy ways. The word aloha has several meanings. If we break up the word into its parts, we will see the word alo, which means face, and ha, which is breath, life. In some ways, it's your breath of life. Aloha may reference the honi and is a symbolic exchange of spirit or life between two individuals. The word haole is you. Um, sorry, let's move on to the next slide. So the term haole also uses the word ha. However, the term is quite the opposite. The word aloha means to share and exchange ha. The word ha ole means the absence of exchange, the absence of ha. The term haole has roots in the time of Captain James Cook, perhaps because he did not greet with honi, or because his failure to reciprocate in cultural exchanges was evident and eventually led to his death. So unfortunately, even today, American culture's emphasis on individuality, capitalism, and progress often conflicts with Hawaiian notions of reciprocity. Thus, Hawaiians often view haole as people who take without giving back. Now, mind you, this isn't the case for everyone. Uh, but it does have an effect on surfing lineups. For example, most visiting surfers come to Hawaii with a particular mindset to prove him or herself to advance his or her career, or to improve their status or ranking in the surfing world. Such individualistic attitudes clash in the Hawaiian waves. For example, ignoring or rejecting reciprocal re uh, expressions of, of aloha is seen as offensive. The following is a mo'olelo of one surfer who rejected the olika hea of a, and aloha from another surfer. Sorry, give me a second. All right, well, I need to find the page. Sorry, thought I was prepared. Okay, so here's the story. This comes out of this book. I have a few copies if anyone's interested. So one example is uh, Hi'iaka, the youngest sister of the fire goddess Pele. While traveling around the island of Oahu, Hi'iaka had an unfriendly encounter in the surf in the Ko'olau district on the east side of Oahu. When she and her party was traveling through Kahana, she appropriately called out to the chiefs of that area with an oli kahea. It's a greeting chant asking permission to enter. Palani and his wife Ievale, known as the surfing chiefs of Kahana, were in the ocean surfing at the time. Perhaps annoyed by the oli, Palani answered Hiiaka with contempt, shouting, Yes, I am Palani, the surfing chief of this land, Kahana. Who are you, conceited woman, who've come over here and called to me? Perhaps you see me surfing here with my wife. You are unfamiliar to me. I rule this place. Who are you? Angered by Palani's disrespectful response, Hiiaka caused the waves to quickly rise. As both Palani and his wife tried to catch the fast-growing surf, the giant waves overcame them, eventually consuming and killing them both. As seen with, in both ancient and modern times, Hawaiian surfers have placed a high value on the notion of respect in the waves. Like Hi'iaka, um, 20th century Hawaiian surfers often took offense at surfers who failed to create and reciprocate relationships of respect and exchange. Although many assume that most tensions in Hawaiian waves is attributed simply to brute territorialism, I disagree. Disrespect and a lack of recognition are the core issues that ignite most conflicts in the Hawaiian surf. In this story of Iivali and Palani, for example, it was 
Palani's failure to recognize and respect Hi'iaka as an individual and as a goddess that got him into trouble, uh, not necessarily his claim over Kahana. In both ancient and contemporary Hawaii, recognition is still critical in social settings. Recognitions of one's family, community, and origins are essential to social relationships in the surf. I'm going to show you this video clip. Um, this is a clip where um, cultural, cultural critic Stuart Hall is analyzing Franz Fanon's definition of the relationship between the slave and the slave master. Um, he explains that this value, that the value of recognition in, of human relationships is very important. He also asserts that there is no recognition going on between the colonizer and the colonized. So this is a very short clip, but we'll take a look at it. The struggle between the master and the slave is a struggle for power, partly for who possesses the products of the slave's labor. This is the bit that interests Fano, because he sees, of course, that the colonizer colonized relationship is a struggle to the death, and indeed in his life he pursues it to the death. At the same time, he sees it is also a struggle by the slave to win recognition, and also the dependency of the master on the recognition from the slave. What Fano says is, in the colonized colonial relationship, there is no recognition going on. And that's why Fano is concerned that racism depersonalizes. It is a denial of recognition. It is the master saying, I do not see you at all. So, I do not see you at all. That is the ultimate expression of disrespect and a source of much tension and unhealthy relations in the waves today. This is expressed in the ocean when surfers ignore each other, especially in a Hawaiian surfing lineup. How is it that Rabbit did not see or foresee the Hawaiian until after it hit him in the face? Stuart Hall explained that racism can depersonalize and render people invisible. Perhaps that contributed to his inability to view Hawaiians in this particular scenario. Some Hawaiians felt that racism was a factor. Um, this is a video clip uh, that I took, and it's very amateur. Um, but this offers a little different insight to that encounter. I'll play it. The club was formed to uh, Terry perpetuate our surfing about history. Why Hawaii. they formed the Hui Ohe'enalu? At that time, the, the surfing world was moving into Hawaii. They were here with all the Australians and all the foreigners were coming here then. Apologize and to the Australians. The Australians are real arrogant, arrogant kind of people. He's they referring specifically days, to the, these guys. The bronze Aussies, that's what they're calling themselves. And they're over here just like walking all over us, you know, with our kind heart and everything we give and let them do, you know, come here and, and, but they started trying to take over everything, you know, oh, we're this, we're that, you know, the, the, so a whole bunch of the local boys go, hey, wait a minute, you know, this is our Aina, you know, so we formed a club to kind of like try to control the, uh, the surfing world. They came off as real arrogant and real egotistical and uh, they weren't too well liked. And they, you know, it's, that's one thing, you know, doing all this in your own country and then coming to somebody else's country, you know, basically having no respect. It's, it's one thing being confident, then there's another thing being arrogant. And this is how these guys came off, is being arrogant. And uh, I guess they, they, uh, they took the Hawaiians, you know, being laid back and uh, real low key is, oh, these guys are nothing, you know, we're going to walk all over them. And... You know, basically the Hawaiians are just, that's how they were, you know, low key, you know, lots of aloha and uh, they, they just said they had enough, you know, uh, no more aloha, you know, the aloha ran out and these, these guys ended up, you know, uh, you know, getting lickings, you know, getting, getting pushing, you know, 
push came to shove, they just push, 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 and pretty soon these guys, you know, uh, snapped and they found out that, you know, hey, these Hawaiians are, you know, they get pretty angry, you mess with them, you know, and. But we were considered Aborigines, I guess, when we when they came over here, we were like back, you know, we were like second race to them. So they thought they could just, you know, white man rule and take over. And we said, screw this, you know, this is not going to happen. All right, so um, Hawaiian surfers have traditionally stood up to um, forms of prejudice and maybe sentiments of racism. Uh, in fact, your town's first surfer is a prime example. I don't know how many of you know this, but this right here is the father of uh, Santa Cruz surfing. Uh, his name is Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole. Um, I grew up on Kalaniana Ole Avenue. And uh, Prince Kuhio is, is a big figure in Hawaii. Um, he, he, was a, he was a surfer, but he was also groomed to be the next king of Hawaii, which never came to pass. Because his auntie, who, was, um, who had designated him as an heir, was overthrown. But he fought, even after um, this overthrow and eventual annexation, to be a leader in Hawaii. Um, he was the nephew of the, the king and the queen, the king's sister. Um, but while he was uh, younger, in grade school, he, went to, he came to school here in San Mateo County, uh, up the road a bit and um, a private school, a military school, and he was um, very well educated. Most of the Hawaiian chiefs and the elites during this time, uh, they're, they're very well educated. He studied in Japan, England, and a bunch of different places. Um, he spoke several languages. Um, he was also quite the athlete, um, not only in um, um, uh, a bunch of sports like surfing, um, but he was also a wrestler and, and knew traditional Hawaiian martial arts. Um, he becomes a senator to the United States um, Congress. He's elected, and I think he sees himself as this role, as this, this king or this chief that he was designed to be, at least in the parameters that he could function in the territory of Hawaii. Here's a story that kind of expresses the sentiment of, of how he felt in experiencing this sort of racism, and I think in some ways relates to Eddie's story that you heard last night of him in South Africa. He's a U.S. Senator and he's in Washington, D.C. He goes to get his hair cut one day and the guy refuses to serve him. Um, he punched the guy, dragged him outside and threw him out on the sidewalk. Um, probably said a few things, maybe in Hawaiians, didn't understand, but, uh, but he said, you know, do you know, you know, do you know who I am? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a prince, and, you know, this is, I'm, I just, you know. It, it's a sense of that goes back to that Stuart Hall making that quote that racism can depersonalize. And I think, unfortunately, oftentimes in the surf, we've gotten to the place where, where we do often uh, ignore other people. How else do you explain um, people just paddling around you in what's called the lineup? I don't even know why we call it a lineup anymore. There's no lines. There should be. Uh, my son and I, they, they were surfing at our, our break outside our house in, on the east side of Oahu. And, um, you know, it was just me and him. And this guy came up and just kept paddling around us. And it was like we were invisible. And um, I think this is a concern that depersonalize each other. And oftentimes race and racism can be the source of that depersonalization. So in conclusion... Uh, Native Hawaiian experiences in the surf are unique and different than lo localism elsewhere. However, even though I'm not going to hypothesize much about localism overseas, I will make one hypothesis about non-Hawaiian motives for localism, because uh, this book also addresses another issue of masculinity. I believe that heightened feelings of emasculation are a source of frustration for many surfers in the lineup today and leads to a variety of bad behavior. Obsession over proving, one, proving oneself in relation to other men seems a bit neurotic to me. Freud theorized that the subconscious threat of castration leads to obsessive kinds of behaviors, including what he called the fetish. I suppose the surf media, we've been harping on them today, so um, sometimes they're partially to, to blame for this, uh, bombarding us with images and videos of hyper-masculine chargers who brave 80-foot jaws, death defying defying chopo, little side note here. Um, if you read that word chopo, it's chopo. I hear chopu and poo just sounds gross to me, but 
Um, and also, uh, we get all these videos of the extra large uh, wave competition and so forth. But perhaps such feelings of impotence are the reason why I have seen grown men displacing their frustration on others, including young kids in the lineup battling minors over knee-high surf. All surfers suffer from a variety of issues, uh, but before we can fix the lineup, we need to evaluate ourselves, our motives, our objectives, and our insecurities. Um, and perhaps that's a good way to start. Mahalo. Thank you.